gone awry, the war on invasive species, and the need for a rational assessment of the costs and benefits of invasive species control. I'm Fritzi Cohen, the organizer of this panel, and I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, uh, Sydney Ross Singer from Hawaii, a medical anthropologist and, bi and biologist living on the Big Island, director of the Good Shepherd Foundation and the Institute for the Study of Culturogenic Disease. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Um, I am hooked up. I'm hooked up. And I also came with my toy, which I'll explain in a little while why I have this. Um, I'm a medical anthropologist, and you might be wondering what a medical anthropologist is doing uh, in an environmental talk. Well, I, I'm from New York City originally, if you can't tell by my accent, and I feel really blessed to be able to move to Hawaii where you can grow your own food and uh, be part of a tropical paradise. And uh, when I first came to Hawaii, I was fascinated by all the, the variety of plant life, uh, beautiful, huge vines and trees everywhere. Uh, I didn't realize that they were all invasive and they were bad. And uh, it took me years to, uh, to come to terms with this. I actually was first introduced to the problem with the koki frog. I don't know if there are any Puerto Ricans in the audience, but the koki frog is the national frog of Puerto Rico. They love this frog. Uh, they identify so much with it that they, they, they call themselves kokis. And the sound, I don't know if you can hear this. Okay? Now that sound is so revered in Puerto Rico that people can't sleep without it. They travel with recordings of kokis to help them sleep. Well, in the mid-80s, the koki frog came to Hawaii, probably in a shipment of plants from Florida or something like that. And uh, it wasn't considered a problem by anyone in the, in the uh, Department of Agriculture because frogs are good for agriculture. They eat pests, they eat insects. And Hawaii has no native frogs, no native reptiles, no native mammals except for a bat and, a, and the monk seal. Uh, Hawaii is, is a lava island in the middle of the ocean. Everything had to get there from somewhere, which really challenges the whole concept of what's native and what's not native. Everything was introduced. Well, in 1999, the koki became a problem because there was suddenly money for invasive species control. Uh, the executive order 13112, signed by President Clinton in 1999, created the Invasive Species Council. And suddenly the koki was now a problem. And there was uh, a massive campaign to vilify the koki, which I was finding shocking because, you know, I was walking into this, this um, grocery store and there was a, a big poster with a frog on it. And my first reaction was, this must be Save the Frog, right? I mean, frogs are dying around the world. They are. They're like the canary in the coal mine. And they're dying around the world from fungus and from development and from other things they don't even know, and climate change. Well, we had these frogs now, and they were saying that the frogs were going to eat all of the insects in Hawaii and basically starve our insectivorous birds. There won't be any insects left because there's no predators for the kokis. And they, their sound was equated to a chainsaw, a leaf blower, and a, a table saw, literally. They started uh, saying that this, this sound was up, up to 100 decibels. And a hysteria was begun about the koki. They also said, and this was in 1999, they also said nothing would kill the koki but caffeine. Now, caffeine is not a pesticide, but it was going to be tested as one. Well. And they were going to apply caffeine 100 times more concentrated than coffee. You would need to have chemical warfare suits. They were going to go through the forest and spray it with caffeine to kill the frog. And it was going to burn through the skin of the frog and give them a heart attack. They also didn't know what it would do to people or the groundwater or non-target species. Frankly, they didn't care about non-target species because they're non-native. So um, I was, as, an, as a medical anthropologist, I have training in medicine, anthropology, biochemistry. And I, I knew that caffeine is a poison. There's no antidote for caffeine poisoning. So I was very upset about this and concerned. And I was seeing that the argument against the koki was not scientific. There was no research. This was, we were afraid it's going to take over. And the words, invasive, take over, uh, it has to be eradicated. 
Um, all of these are war metaphors. And I started seeing that this was propaganda. We weren't getting a scientific analysis of the cookie fraud. There was no information. This was propaganda. And um, I, I, being a biochemist, I, was, uh, I realized that there's a lot of money that goes into developing a pesticide. And I was wondering, what, what's the money behind caffeine? Why are they doing this? Because they had to get an emergency exemption from the Environmental Protection Agency to test caffeine in the environment. And they were going to let people and animals and everything back in after 24 hours of spray. There'd still be residue. They didn't know what was going to go on. Well, I googled genetically engineered caffeine, because that's what you do these days. Everything is genetically engineered. And lo and behold, University of Hawaii has a patent on the caffeine gene. Okay? They were able to extract the gene of caffeine from coffee, put it, and you can then take that and put it into bacteria and basically grow caffeine in the lab. And the, um, the university owned the patent. It was obtained in 1999. Uh, coincidentally, the same year that they said this was a pest and that they said nothing would kill them but caffeine. So um, obviously there was a big conflict of interest here. And uh, I started to be aware that invasion biology is a real threat to the environment. Uh, and here you were having a species that was being vilified. Now, I love animals. And to see a frog being considered, you know, the newspapers weekly would say that this was a shrill shriek, literally, those are the words, this is a shrill shriek that will keep you awake at night, drive away tourists, and even cause hearing loss. <laughs> Seriously. And they were measuring decibels a foot and a half from the frog and saying, you know, it, it, which is really a strange thing because they're in trees. But, you know, um, and they were saying that this, this is 100 decibels and there's nothing good you can say about these animals. Now, you go to Puerto Rico, there's nothing bad you can say about these animals. So I realized Hawaii didn't have a frog problem, it had an attitude problem. And I started fighting this and exposing this and actually helped, when I told the EPA about the conflict of interest, they pulled the exemption and about $9 million from the USDA that was going to go to Hawaii to kill the frogs was stopped when I told them about this. Uh, because it was an obvious conflict, but it began my journey. I, I was, what made me really upset was um, I read one of the other authors, one of the other speakers, David Theodoropoulos, wrote a phenomenally good book, and he, in his book he talks about the origins of invasion biology. And he's going to talk more about it, but I want to touch on it because that's part of my story too. It, it began with the Nazis, and in the 1930s, the Nazis were on a campaign to try to eradicate all introduced species in Europe and bring back medieval, you know, old flora and fauna. Get rid of the introductions. They don't belong here. When you start hearing things like they don't belong here, uh, it, it sounds like the hate, you know? Get rid of the immigrants. And what this really is, is an, an anti-immigration policy for species. And what I started to experience in Hawaii, which you think of as a, a diverse place, I started to experience this native species supremacism. And what we started to see was that, you know, if you, as soon as you label something invasive, it, there's nothing good about it. You cannot say anything good about it. It's like an environmental McCarthyism. If, if you label them invasive, they are bad. And anybody who supports them is bad. And I got alienated from a lot of my friends who thought I was great. I mean, I'm a medical anthropologist. I write about, I study how the, our culture makes us sick. That's what I do. I run the Institute for the Study of Culturogenic Disease. And I look at how our cultural attitudes and behaviors lead us to do things that are contrary to our biological natures and cause disease. And I was seeing a disease being created by the hysteria over this frog. People were going out in their backyards with one sound of a frog and putting gasoline on their, on their uh, lawns and, and their bushes and trying to burn the frog and do whatever they could. Well, when caffeine was stopped, they now going to citric acid. They literally burn the frogs to death with citric acid. They go into the forest and spray it with acid, all right? And if you did that here, it would be considered animal cruelty, and it would have been in Hawaii, but they passed the law. Uh, by law, are calling this an agricultural pest. <clears throat> it's not an agricultural pest. But the legislature did, because that allows you to get away with animal cruelty. If it's a pest, you know, like rats, you don't have to worry about poisoning them or killing them. They're a pest. As soon as something's designated a pest, you don't have to worry about any humane issues. So burning a frog to death was allowed by that. Also, it gave them rights to enter your property. As soon as it's an ag pest, they can come on to exterminate and eradicate, even if you don't want them to. 
So it became a real social crisis with continued reinforcement of how this frog is terrible. And to this day, the only reason it really stopped was they ran out of money. They spent millions of dollars spraying for frogs. And every time they sprayed, the frogs spread, and they couldn't stop them. But neighbors were turning on neighbors, threatening to sue because they had frogs. I can't sleep with this sound. This is terrible. They have no predators. Well, they do have predators. Cokies eat baby cokies. That's why the males protect the females. These are very interesting frogs. They, um, they lay eggs that hatch, the they, they frog legs hatch in the eggs, so they don't go through a tadpole stage in the water. They go through it in their little eggs. So these frogs lay their eggs underneath leaf matter. The males protect the babies after they hatch as tiny froglets, and any bird that would eat an insect would eat a baby cokey frog, because they're like a couple of millimeters, and then they grow to about an inch, an inch and a half. And they're territorial, and they talk to the males, do the singing, and they talk to each other. And I live with them in a rainforest that I now call the Hawaii Koki Frog Sanctuary and Nature Preserve. And despite the fact that the government thinks I'm now you know, in possession of these frogs, they're now trying to pass a law in Hawaii that if you possess an invasive species, you could be fined. Just possessing them. And who's going to determine what's invasive and what's not? Well, I was seeing basically a social pathology being created by creating an hysteria and hatred for a natural animal. And it got so bad that at one point a few years ago, they actually were doing a contest that I stopped, fortunately, but it was announced in the papers, it was ready to go. The schools on the big island where I live were going to have a contest for Halloween, a bounty hunter campaign for the Pokies. You go out and you kill the frogs and bring them to school. And whoever has the most dead frogs will win. That school will win PlayStation 3 and Xboxes, which are violent video games. So when I contacted <laughs> the Board of Education, I said, are you crazy? You're supposed to be doing humane education. They backtracked so fast. Oh, we didn't know about it. It was incredible. They just denied. And the whole thing didn't happen. But it was in the newspapers. It was about to happen. But that's how bad it got. They're training children that the lesson is, if you don't like the sounds of nature, kill it. And the excuse is it's not native. Well, this isn't limited to the Koki. I then, I live, I, I have this nature sanctuary. We have some acres. And we have lots of wild strawberry guava, and guava, and wild avocados, and mangoes, and passion fruit. And it's phenomenal taking a walk. I mean, talk about a city kid growing up like this now. You take a walk in the forest, and you pick what you want, and you eat it. And it's wonderful lifestyle. Collect our own water. We're completely off the grid. We live the kind of lifestyle that people are talking about. It's wonderful. We have our own goats for goat milk. We have sheep. We have horses, and ducks, and and chickens, and it's like living off the earth, and it's a beautiful lifestyle, but we are an endangered species, because everything that I use to live is considered now invasive. Now, the strawberry guava is an ornamental fruit tree brought to Hawaii 200 years ago. It has a fruit, a small fruit, that is considered a superfood, higher in vitamin C than oranges. It's a beautiful ornamental fruit tree. And now, because it's, you know, when they clear with a bulldozer, <coughs> certain species come up in monoculture. And along the roads, you'll see strands of strawberry guava, and you sort of can't even see through them, they're so thin. <coughs> but in the forest, they've been here 200 years, so they spread wherever they're going to, as long as there wasn't ground disturbance. And what, so now, though, they, they want to get rid of those strawberry <coughs> guava. Which brings up another interesting problem with this whole thing. How are they going to get rid of the strawberry guava? They want to release a biocontrol insect. That is from Brazil, where strawberry guava is from. This is a scale insect, and it's going to gall the leaves of the strawberry guava and cause the guava to get sick. All the leaves will have bubbles on it, galls. The leaves, it will defoliate the tree. They won't be able to produce fruit, and it won't be able to spread. That was the theory. The problem is, I have thousands of these trees on my property. People all over Hawaii have these trees. We love these trees. But they don't want them in the forest. So the forest managers... Oh wow, time flies. The forest managers are um, wanting to release this. The bottom line is, biocontrol affects private property rights. And our private property has to, you know, there's a legal aspect to this. If you're going to release insects and it's going to affect private property, you're going to have to compensate property owners. And that argument has forestalled that biocontrol. But um, I guess I'll have to save the rest for later and questions and answers. My bottom line is, I believe that the nativity, the, the idea of invasory biology has only added one aspect to the argument of whether things are weeds or pests. We've always had weeds or pests, and we always will. But invasion biology 
portrays things in terms of nativity. Where are you from? If we think of this in human terms, this is basically an anti-immigration policy. It's a xenophobia. And implied to biology, it's a bio-xenophobia. And it's causing environmental destruction because these species have become naturalized, they're part of the environment, and if we attack them because they weren't here 400 years ago, then we're going to be destroying the environment. And one last point, with climate change, everything is changing. Preservation is basically, has to be re reconfigured because the conditions from 400 years ago when these native species existed are changing. So we can't go back. We have to go forward. And these introduced species are the future. And if we kill the future species, then we're going to be, then we're going to be, um, we're going to have sick environments. So I'll, I'll just leave I didn't get to tell you about the mangroves that are being poisoned in Hawaii because they're not native. They were brought 100 years ago. Mangroves around the world are being uh, planted to protect shoreline, provide fisheries, and so forth. They're considered one of the most valuable species on the planet. Now in Hawaii, they're poisoning them and leaving them poisoned dead along the shoreline because they don't belong, they're not native. We had another minute. <laughs> okay, uh, our next speaker is David Theodorakoulos, who is a bold visionary on this issue, and basically the author of Invasion Biology, a critique of the pseudoscience, and it's the first comprehensive refutation of invasion biology. And if any of you are wondering how this has been greeted by the the environmental world and others, it's been a very, very difficult road because this is not a subject that is easy to discuss because a lot of people really just stop the discussion and David has kept it going on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm probably going to have to really rush this. Uh, okay. Sid uh, basically covered the language. Uh, Okay, if you take home just one word from this talk, remember Monsanto. <laughs> Every time you hear the term invasive species, think Monsanto. <laughs> okay, to be a science, uh, a field must be objective, verifiable, repeatable, and predictive. Objective definition of terms is essential in science, and evolution <laughs> biology stands or falls on uh, the definition of native, the concept of native. Now, no biologist can identify what species is native to an area without prior knowledge. There are no measurable criteria, no observable characteristics that can distinguish native from non-native. Uh, native and non-native are illusions. Bison, bear, and deer are immigrants from Eurasia. Mammoths were present here until only 7,500 years ago. Uh, ginkgo fossils are found in Oregon. Tree of Heaven uh, was here in the tertiary. And now that it's come home, it's being killed as an invader. Uh, change and movement are natural. Forests ebb and flow across the landscape, and they continually change in content from oaks to conifers to beech to birch and so on. The jaguar formerly ranged north to the edge of the Arctic tundra in North America. Lions lived in an ice-free desert in northern Alaska during the last ice age and were present throughout North America. Horses, the horse family evolved here in North America, radiated to other continents, became extinct here, it came home, and now it's being killed as an invader. Harm is another concept that is redefined at will in invasion biology. That's how you can tell invasion biology is a pseudoscience. No matter what the species, no matter what the effects, they are called harmful. If an invader has fruits, then it's using the birds to spread, or it's competing with native fruit bearers for dispersal. If it has no fruits, then it's harmful because it's useless for wildlife. 
<laughs> An African American once said, if I stand, I am loitering. If I walk, I am prowling. If I run, I am fleeing. Same mentality in invasion biology. Uh, it's also based on these discredited ecological concepts like the balance of nature. Uh, natural biota are not co-evolved balanced systems, but are accustomed to uh, accepting and integrating new species. If you look at the uh, paleontology, you'll see that's true. Oh, and in fact, in all cases throughout the world, including the oceanic islands, the invasion has increased biological diversity at all levels. Invasion is also entirely natural. Uh, note this dense invading monoculture. This is the native bracken fern. There is no scientific model that can distinguish this from an alien invasion. So cause or symptom. Uh, these are the true causes of invasions. Invaders are disturbance indicators. They're symptoms of abuse of the land or pollution or changes like that. So okay, a reality check. Purple loose right, poster weed of invasion, hysteria. It's said to form monotypic stands, destroying water, waterfowl habitat. This is untrue. A study of 258 plots found higher bird densities in loose strife. Another study found no significant difference in plant species richness, regardless of the density of loose strife. There is no scientific justification for loose strife control. Salt cedar is called an ecological disaster, one of the nation's worst weeds, said to crowd out natives and destroy river ecosystems. Yet, plant diversity is actually greater in salt cedar stands than in native cottonwood, and bird and insect species richness and density is equal to native vegetation. In fact, 90% of the endangered willow flycatcher nests in salt cedar. There is no evidence that it harms river ecosystems. Uh, eucalyptus, it's said to invade and destroy ecosystems, killing plants and birds. Uh, note these dense native shrubs based this eucalyptus. Uh, studies found 47 species of native birds using the tree in California, and the understory includes 36 plant species. Uh, these photographs were taken at the base of the eucalyptus trunk. Compare this to the complete suppression of understory by this invader the California redwood, which invaded California from the north during the tertiary. Uh, Monarch stands are the preferred sites for, uh, eucalyptus stands are the preferred sites for overwintering monarch uh, congregations, and this clear cut is what the nativists are doing to our groves in California. Uh, yellow star thistle, it's said to be of no use to wildlife. Uh, this bumblebee doesn't agree. This, uh, the camouflage hunting spider, uh, skipper, the butterfly, uh, these are a couple of species of wild bees. Okay, note the sharp ecotone of the barbed wire fence in the 1999 photograph. Dead star thistle on this side. Barbed wire cannot stop thistle seed. This proves that the thistle is a symptom of past land use. Note that ten years later, <coughs> The star thistle has receded, native shrubs have increased. This is entirely without any management at all. Uh, hydrilla is called uh, Florida's most aggressive alien plant species. It supports the highest bird species diversity in Florida and the highest fish density and biomass with six times the density and five times the biomass as the native Potomogenon. There, there's other causes of invasion. Invasion is claimed that invasive species cause Australian mammal extinctions. Yet these occurred only after the genocidal displacement of the aboriginal peoples and the consequent loss of their traditional land management practices. In the southwest, uh, bird diversity dropped after Indian farmers were forced from the land to create protected parks. <coughs> Amazonian Indians increase rainforest species diversity and traditional Swiss grazing practices increase alpine meadow biodiversity. In Africa, traditional peoples have maintained 
the greatest, the planet's greatest remaining megafauna. We, we, we can be good citizens of the planet. We can live on this planet, and everything we do is not harmful. Uh, invaders are commonly beneficial. The zebra mussel cleared polluted water in Lake Erie and in increased the catch of native yellow perch fivefold in abandoned Amazonian grazing land. And invasive solanum aids the regeneration of native forests. Fire ants destroy agricultural pests, improve soils, and do not harm native ants and birds. Gorse protects endangered species in New Zealand and speeds native forest regeneration. These, all of these beneficial effects are carefully ignored by invasionists who are promoting a crisis. Invasionists are increasingly extremist. Native plants are killed just miles outside their historic range. National Park Policy states that if mountain goats spread into Yellowstone from introduced, southern, introduced northern populations, they'll be killed as invaders. But if the same species spreads into the park from the west, they'll be welcomed because they are from natural population. Uh, even in endangered species are exterminated where they have naturalized outside their ranges. The Monterey Cypress. Uh, the two small stippled areas, number four and down there, those are the world's only original stands of Monterey Cypress. Uh, just a few hundred, a few hundred acres. Yet this endangered species is destroyed as an invader in South Africa, New Zealand, and even in California, just 50 miles from these stands. These invading populations are in fact the best case scenario of endangered species conservation, the establishment of self-sustaining wild populations and safe new habits, and should be protected, not destroyed. Australian invasionists have created a genetically engineered plague that sterilizes rabbits and a 100% fatal mousepox. After they published their methods, they realized that their, their very methods could be used to create a doomsday plague from human smallpox. So invasion biology is going to the very ends of mass death. So now we come to the big, scary end word that uh, Sid touched on. Invasion biology originated as an organized movement in Nazi Germany, and it is currently being used by the racist national vanguard to justify their spurious views. This is Adolf Hitler shaking hands with Alvin Seifert, the man who was charged with cleansing the German Reich of non-native plants. Forty years ago, the threats to nature were pollution, pesticides, poisons, bulldozers, and chainsaws. Now we are told that the greatest threats to nature are wild plants and animals. And the cure, poisons, bulldozers, and chainsaws. Now ask yourself, who does this serve? Monsanto. <laughs> Follow the money. Invasion biology is deeply corrupted by the herbicide and regulatory industries. Anti-invader publications that call plants pollution and chemicals the cure are supported by herbicide manufacturers. The exotic pest plant councils are herbicide industry front group. Monsanto employee Melroy Jackson was a founding board member of the of Cal Epsi and was on the National Invasive Species Advisory Board, Advisory Committee, his job at Monsanto, developing new markets for herbicides. Monsanto Booth at a Cal Epsi meeting. Now how can we tolerate this corruption of environmentalism by industry? Monsanto brought us PCBs, Agent Orange, Roundup, bovine growth hormone, patented plants, genetically engineered crops and foods forced on farmers and consumers and harassed on the family farms. So when Monsanto tells you they want to help nature by extending herbicide use into parks and wildlands, do you believe them? No. <laughs> okay, most control programs are futile and are expensive giveaways to pesticide manufacturers. 
The Murex fire ant spraying program wasted hundreds of millions of dollars with zero success and actually killed native ants, allowing the fire ant to spread. <laughs> Over a billion dollars was wasted spraying DDT against the tiger mosquito with zero success, and massive spraying against the gypsy moth only exterminated native butterflies. If your aim is to poison the land and water, wreck havoc in ecosystems, and funnel billions into corporate coffers, Yes, these programs were successful. <laughs> uh, government agencies use the basics to increase funding and control. In the corporate state, regulations that are allegedly to protect the environment are actually designed to disadvantage small farms and grassroots efforts. New regulations, invasive regulations, prevent farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange of seeds and crops and biological controls. This is the corporate theft of the biological products. Invaders are called the second greatest cause of endangerment. This is untrue. Only another minute. Uh, well, less than six percent of endangered species are even affected by invaders, and the claim of 137 billion dollars in costs also fiction. I used Pimentel's exact method methods and came up with a figure of 11 trillion dollars in benefit just from the uh, the, the zebra mussel. Okay, really quickly, see the sidebar. This is from the peer-reviewed journal of Ecological Restoration. Sidebar says, research under buckthorn shows that it, it, the, the soil under buckthorn may be nitrogen-rich and devoid of soil microfauna. These are scans from the article buckthorn was colonized faster and reached higher levels of microarthropods than all other types except cherry. Uh, Shannon diversity was comparable. But then the sidebar, devoid of soil microfauna. What is going on here? Am I, am I the only person on the planet that read that paper? <laughs> okay, scientific misconduct includes false or misleading statements and omission of material facts. A fact is considered material if others would alter their conduct and reliance upon it. The repeated failures of invasion crisis promoters that disclose contradictory data are serious. I believe that, okay, billions have been spent on control projects that are unjustifiable and have been based on misleading statements and the omission of facts by scientists and bureaucrats. And I believe that if omission of material facts occurs in, the, uh, in obtaining public funds, broad statutes should apply. So just to sum up, it's, it's a pseudoscience, it's voodoo ecology, it's the eugenics of modern environmentalism, it's, it's a dangerous ideology, and uh, invasives are actually helping the planet heal. And I guess I'm over time.
And when we move around, we carry things with us. And nobody is saying, oh, let's stop moving around, which would stop some of this. But we're not saying that. So if we're not going to say that, we're going to accept ourselves and how we are, then we have to accept the fact that species are moving, they're moving often with us. We are changing ecosystems so that species that we bring with us can move into these places and succeed very well. And it really is uh, an evolving process. I mean, evolution of life has done that. Species have spread around. Uh, some have disappeared. Some have, have flourished at different times. We are changing the climate. We are changing the global, the whole global um, environment. So we cannot expect everything biological to stay exactly the same as it is. And by going out and killing everything, we can end up with nothing. Um, so that so that is uh, something that we really need to do is face ourselves, what we do, understand ourselves. Uh, how do I change this? <laughs>
Uh, change, change in ecosystems is caused uh, by, or, or excuse me, the, the shape of an ecosystem, I mean, what the species, the species that are there, the biodiversity, what it looks like at any one time, is caused by a number of things, including the age of the ecosystem. Some are young and have plenty of room for other species. Some are older and have high biodiversity, and those tend not to accept new species very well. Um, the geomorphology of a, spa of a, of a place um, will determine what can live there. I'm thinking in terms of own ecosystems, the shape of an estuary, for instance. Uh, the geology, the chemistry, the climate, construct, catastrophic events and their frequency, um, changing boundaries among species, all of these things are moving <coughs> and changing in time and space. And we should not uh, worry, worry so much about the consequences of change. And others advise us to get a sense of place, and I think that that may, in fact, guide us to a better acceptance of ourselves, our own role, and our understanding of what is happening in nature around us as we change it and as natural changes occur. And it's not just to see, oh, this is how it was when I was a child, and this is how it should always be, but to understand the, the fluctuations of it and to really be part of it, because we are part of it. Terry Tempest Williams tells us that beauty is not optional, but is a strategy for survival. And she goes on to suggest that fragments of things can be put together in very beautiful ways. And when an ecosystem changes, it, it may become fragmented, but it may come back, it should ultimately come back together into a, a more beautiful, into a beautiful structure that may be different than it was before.
go on record as saying that I, I think it is good policy to prevent invasions. There are plenty of examples of troublesome and even harmful invasive species. We teach this in classes. That said, once an invasion occurs, you have to use the best science, you have to use some common sense, and you have to do a cost-benefit analysis to determine whether the cost of control is worth it or not. Some invasive species are actually beneficial. This is one of them. So you have to look at the environmental costs of control and the, and the economic costs and benefits. There are, there are both. Now, um, as earlier speakers have said, uh, many invasive species are not nearly as problematic as they're made out to be. David talked talk about the purple loose stripe here. Uh, there's, this has been the poster child of uh, invasive species in wetlands all across North America, and yet there's really no evidence that this plant has actually caused any, any real problems. Um, evidence is mounting that introduction, introductions are often benign or even beneficial. Uh, this prickly pear, which invades Mediterranean ecosystems, benefits native plants by attracting pollinators. Um, and you can find a lot of evidence like this now of, uh, of benefits. Rarely is any single species all bad or all good. You can, you can in any invasive species, you can find, you can find benefits, and you, you can probably find problems too. You have to. And you have to weigh this very carefully against the cost of control. Um, take the case of this Spartina alterniflora, this salt marsh grass that I have worked on. Uh, paradoxically, this is estimated to provide high-value high ecosystem services on the east coast, but on the west coast it's regarded as a pest. Now, interestingly, I should add that the Spartina on the west coast was introduced uh, around the turn of the century by oyster fishermen who were trying to introduce the East Coast oyster to the West Coast. And they shipped the, the oysters out here packed in crates in Spartina grass. Well, the East Coast oyster didn't do well here, so they went and found oysters from Asia, uh, the, the uh, Japonica. So that, now that's what you have in your, in your estuaries here now. You have the, the Pacific oyster, which um, is um, part of the problem, I think. I think the, uh, a lot of the pressure for eliminating this Spartina is actually coming from the oyster industry, but that's another story. This Spartina, uh, you can actually, uh, it's, it's fashionable now to try and put an economic value on different kinds of ecosystems, ecosystem services. And this particular plant in, in salt marshes provides some protection from from storms, the, the, the grasses knock down the amplitudes of storm surges as they come ashore, protecting uh, infrastructure. Uh, they, they act like wastewater treatment plants. Uh, they're fantastic at removing nutrients from water and, and sediments. And so they perform the function of a tertiary treatment plant. They are a refugia and habitat for uh, fish and shrimp. Uh, they produce food. Uh, for marine resources, uh, they pr produce uh, raw materials, and they are, they are areas that are valued for recreation. All of these, all of these benefits, you can put a dollar uh, figure on, and, they, uh, and it's been estimated that these ecosystems have a value of about fourteen thousand dollars per hectare, or or nearly six thousand dollars per acre. Now, once carbon cap and trade kicks in, the value of these systems really goes up because they also sequester a lot of carbon. They take up CO2 from the atmosphere and they bury it in the soil. That's worth about $18,000 an acre. So these are pretty, pretty valuable ecosystems. Not all ecosystems have the same values. E eelgrass ecosystems have very high values. This is a table here of different economic values of different systems. Salt marshes, 4,300. Uh, Mudflat, 800. 
and so on. I think there's a little bit of, I, this, um, I, this is one aspect of valuing e e ecosystems that, that troubles me a little bit because this gets, this gets, its, it gets, gets us into the, the area of, well, my ecosystem is more valuable than your ecosystem. And I don't think that's a, a very healthy place to, to go, but nevertheless. So the, the agencies here in California have decided to get rid of this plan, and there is a West Coast Governor's Action Plan that has some very interesting information in it. This is a map here on the left of where these uh, invasions are established, and those are the different Spartina species there on the left. Anglica there is from Europe, Patens is from the East Coast, Densa flora is from South America, Alterna flora from the East Coast, and then there are um, a lot of hybrids. And so you can see how they're distributed. Now these figures here are from this action plan. And the figures are totally misleading, and I'd love to know who drew, drew these things. The figure on the top shows a cross-section of what one of your marshes is supposed to look like. And these are this is high marsh vegetation here. This is the level of, of the mean high, high water in your estuaries. Here's mean, mean, mean low, low water down here. And notice where the yield grass is plotted in this figure. Um, somewhere around mean sea level or, or above. So eel grass does not grow there. Eel grass grows at a lower elevation. Now this is the, the, the bottom figure is the, an artist's rendition of what the marshes are going to look like after the, the evil invader Spartina comes in and you'll notice that um, the Spartina grasses now have have taken over this entire zone right up to the edge of a, of a, a sheer cliff. It just drops off into deep water like there's a canyon there and there is no eelgrass. The Spartina has completely eliminated the eelgrass and that is total fiction. That is not what's going to happen. Uh, first of all, Spartina and eelgrass do not share the same habitat. This is uh, the, the figure on the left, this is from, uh, data from a friend of mine who's out here, um, Ripsic, and this is the distribution of the eelgrass with, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a function of the elevation relative to the mean sea level. So here's mean sea level here, and this is the eelgrass growing at an elevation below mean sea level and peaking somewhere around mean low, low water. So this is a really deep uh, um, this is a plant that grows you know, pretty far down in the inner tunnel zone. Here's Spartina over here, or Spartina. <coughs> Here's mean sea level here, and this is mean high water is up here somewhere. So Spart Spartina is a, uh, grows in the upper half of the inner tidal zone, not the lower half. So first of all, that's a big fiction that the Spartina is going to eliminate the overhead. So here is my take on, on what's really going to look like. So this is the governor's figure of the way things are today, except that uh -uh, this does not grow here, sorry. Um, F and, and this is there uh, after. Uh-uh, that's not going to happen. What's probably going to happen is something closer to this. The Spartina is going to take over uh, some of this mudflat area. There's still going to be plenty of eelgrass around. They, there's still going to be mud flat. The thing that's not that's a little misleading here is that there's, there's going to be considerable mud flats still. Um, we can look at we can look for the uh, at, at European experience to get a to, to make some predictions about what's going to happen. Spartina, Spartina anglica was introduced in the Western Europe in the 1930s to stabilize sediments and harbors, and if this notion that they're going to completely take over the environment and eliminate shorebirds, eliminate oysters, mudflats, etc., if that was true, well, we would probably see that in Western Europe. So here's a marsh in, in Denmark where I've worked, and this is a Google image. This is a, uh, a dune barrier island here. Here's the Spartina Anglica that's established here. And here, look at all of that. What does that look like to you? That's mud flat. Okay? Oyster, oyster habitat. 
A friend of mine, a Dutch friend of mine, uh, Spartina Anglica, was introduced in Dutch estuaries in the 1930s. And historical aerial photographs document a rapid expansion of the salt marsh area in the 1930s and 40s. Since then, there's been little new expansion, only locally on a much smaller scale. It is definitely not true that all mudflats converted into Spartina marshes. I roughly guess, guess that about 10 to 20 percent of the original mudflat area converted. That's a local expert. This also is from the governor's report. And they use language here like, clones of hybrid Spartina look like bacteria in petri dishes. Ooh, <laughs> that sounds terrible, doesn't it? And look at this. Oh, God, it looks like colonies of E. coli. And then over here, here invasive Spartina threatens to, to colonize thousands of acres of mudflats that are essential foraging habitat for millions of migratory residents, shorebirds, and waterfowl. You're going to lose your birds. <laughs> this is the marsh in Denmark where this <laughs> was, it was, was planted in the 1930s. Those are birds. <laughs> <laughs> and that's mudflat. And there's a new equilibrium that's been established between the vegetated area and the mud and the birds. And everything is happy. Not a problem. So, um, I'll leave you with a few conclusions. In general, it is a good policy to prevent the introduction of alien species into new habitats. I agree with that. There are convincing examples of invasives that have become harmful pests. You know, the problem is we don't know. We can't predict. When, a, when an invader comes in, you just can't predict. Is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? So, good policy. Try and keep them out. On the other hand, not all invasives are troublesome. Some are beneficial. And you have to weigh it on a case-by-case -case basis. Spartina, uh, as a good example, will transform estuaries. Where it is introduced, it will transform estuaries. But there's no evidence of harmful impacts. To the contrary, this East Coast native provides high-value ecosystem services. It is good policy to weigh the costs of control against the benefits of control. And the costs of control here on the West Coast will include the spraying of herbicides, uh, and they're using something called the Mazapir right now, in perpetuity, because you will never get rid of this plant. You will always be in a control mode trying to knock its population down and kill it. And it seems to me that that's not a good idea. So I'll just leave it at that.